over to you, Toby. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Holly. And welcome, everyone uh, from around the world to uh, this Electoral Integrity Project workshop. Um, the Electoral Integrity Project was founded in 2012, um, which some of you does feel like a long time ago, others perhaps not so long. And uh, I can just about remember the first workshop, uh, which was actually held uh, in Madrid, back, back in the olden days where we could actually meet in, in, in person. Um, but of course, the study of electoral integrity has actually been around for much, much longer. It wasn't always called electoral integrity. Sometimes it was called fair and free elections, or perhaps electoral malpractice, or, or clean elections, for example. And even before those terms came along, the quality of elections was still very much studied, but just much more in a more piecemeal way, uh, which focused perhaps on parts of the electoral process that were a concern in particular countries at particular moments in time. So, for example, electoral system disproportionality uh, was, a, was a key topic, or gerrymandering became a key focus, or voting rights uh, and, and so on, which left lots of hidden spaces um, understudied and unconnected. So a major advance came when Pippa Norris focused the Electoral Integrity Project on the electoral cycle approach, stressing that elections are only as strong as the weakest part, part of, the, of the process. So what we want to, do, to, jo to join, uh, sorry, what we'd like you to join us in is to try to set the agenda for the future research on electoral integrity. Where should future research go. Now some of you in the audience uh, might be early career researchers, uh, either doing your PhD or having recently completed your PhD and you're thinking about the next project, for example. Some of you, um, even the established academics, thinking, well, what is the next um, thing in the pipeline that we would want to, to focus on? And I guess one of the things that, that's clear is that research agendas and concepts, uh, when we try to set them out, uh, they often need to respond uh, to the real world uh, developments and real world problems. You must respond to what is important. And it's also the case that research agendas and concepts really need to be and can be enriched by listening to the people on the ground that are actually involved in running elections, the practitioners uh, themselves. So the importance of the electoral cycle, for example, uh, that was something quite well known uh, in the practitioner community, but much less known uh, amongst academics before Pippa Norris uh, put that at, at the forefront. And it's, and it's practitioners uh, that know what's happening on the ground. And it's really important that the, as, as academics uh, kind of leave our ivory towers and actually produce research, uh, which is really important uh, in trying to identify uh, what works. So what we thought we'd do in, the, in this first workshop is to have a round table focusing on this question uh, with some deep reflection about what next what should the priority be for future electoral integrity research? What does the practitioner community need? What are the new threats? How, how have these changed since, for example, 2012? What's, what are the things to be, to be aware of? Do we need new concepts or are the old, old concepts um, just as good? Do we need to update international standards? And where are those gaps in, in knowledge? So by doing this, what we want to to do um, was to very much give practitioners the first stage uh, in, in this respect. Um, and so we've got a panel uh, with four practitioners uh, with huge um, academic, academic knowledge as well, but huge experience of running elections and being involved in the electoral process. And we wanted to turn to them and ask for their insights on, on this topic. So first of all, uh, we'll begin um, with uh, David Carroll, um, who's the director of the Democracy Programme at the Carter Centre, where he leads the Centre's initiative on international election standards and best practices. He's participated in more than 70 uh, Carter Centre projects to strengthen democracy and electoral processes around the globe, either in Latin America, Africa, Asia, or the Middle East. So um, David, I'm delighted, thank you for, for joining us and delighted to let you have, have the floor. Thank you, Toby, and thank you, Holly. It's a, a real pleasure to be at the another uh, Electoral Integrity Project event, uh, the pre-IPSA uh, conference, and to join everybody in this session. 
Uh, so, and I'm very excited about the future of the Electoral Integrity Project. I think we're well positioned to continue to make great strides. Um, my comments today will be from the perspective of uh, an international election observation organization and a practitioner focused on election observation and democratization and how elections fit into, into that process. And to note that we've started from uh, or we always start from the foundation of assuming that um, states value democratic legitimacy, usually through externally validated elections and reinforced by the international norms and institutions that promote those. And that in that context, election observation can play an important role, informational role, providing transparency and third party validation. We provide trusted information, we help build confidence in that process, we shape the perceptions of external stakeholders and domestic stakeholders, and hopefully we catalyze an agenda for reform. That's been our, our existing framework. Today I'd like to talk about a few key threats that election integrity faces and the work that we do faces, and list a few key research areas and questions. These will all, I think, be familiar to everybody, but perhaps still worth uh, mentioning. And also some of the questions and concepts that we use uh, in, a, in measuring election integrity. So the, the threats that I'd like to focus on, and again, these won't be you know, new or different from what people are aware of, but I think most fundamentally the changing international order and the erosions of norms and institutions of liberal international democracy. This has been a process that's been, I think, you know, potentially underway for you know, 10 or more years, but it's increasingly evident and linked to this is the rise of authoritarians and non-democratic populists. What is that doing to uh, election integrity, the process of trying to build election integrity and how that it connects to the broader international system? The second one closely related also is the vulnerable information environment and information ecosystem that all of this is operating within. So in those kind of clusters of threats, what are the research questions? What are the, the things that we need to be spending more time thinking about both in our knowledge gaps, concepts and measurement? I'm just going to list a series of questions that you know off that occurred to me as a practitioner. What tools do authoritarians use increasingly to create false images of democracy and democratic elections? Are they using new tools or are there changing patterns of use of different kinds of tools? We're familiar with many of the old, you know, tried and true ways, uh, you know, electoral and judicial institutions that are captive and lack independence, lack of the ability for there to be genuine competition, intimidation of civil society and media, restrictive domestic laws for media and civil society, uh, maybe violence. How are those tools changing? Are there new tools? This may be related to uh, social media as well. Will democracy building tools that we've looked at in the past and that may have worked in the past, will they continue to work in the future as this international structure is changing? Uh, how do authoritarian regimes try to insulate themselves increasingly from external pressure from democratic reform? How do they try to blunt criticisms of their democracy and human rights record, uh, including from election observers and others and in international institutions, and to weaken the reach of the international norms? To what extent are global sh these global shifts increasing resistance and hostility to observers? We see this uh, in our work at the Carter Center, and, and I'm sure others do as well. It's more difficult uh, in many instances to expect that you'll get that invitation and, and accreditation to observe. There's increasingly re uh, hostility or restrictive approaches to outside actors. Um, more use of zombie observers. And how does that translate into you know, credibility and meaningful uh, elections? Are there more obstacles when you are in a country to do your work in a meaningful way, to have the access that you need to, to provide a thorough independent assessment? Is there evidence of de decreased leverage and consequences that flow from having negative reports about a country's democracy or human rights record? Or a, you know, fewer incentives on the flip side for there to be meaningful democratic reform? What other sources uh, can supplement or replace some of the work that international observers have done? Fact-checking institutions, domestic observers, and how can there be greater collaboration across all of those? More broadly, bigger picture, 
how can this in existing international framework for human rights and international standards be reinforced? How can those norms and institutions be strengthened, given this kind of the threats that they face? And how can democracies themselves better deliver and show that they're meeting their citizens' needs? Uh, on the second question, uh, vulnerable information ecosystems uh, and disorder, the key issues of information integrity, disinformation, information disorder, cyber threats, hacking, all of the things we're very familiar with, a couple of questions I would highlight. What are the strategies and tools that are used increasingly to undermine public confidence in elections and the, and the accuracy of, of uh, media and information environment? And you know, for us, very specifically, what is the impact of all of this disinformation on public trust and confidence and credibility in elections? Uh, you know, connected to that, are there impacts on voting and participation? Are there different trends in political norms of behavior? Perhaps uh, you know, fewer ex instances of losers accepting results you know, clearly and early in a post-election process. Um, are there trends in electoral violence connected to all of this? Looking both cross-nationally and inside countries uh, with micro-level data. Related to this, what is the uh, impact of disinformation on political beliefs and behavior? <clears throat> to what extent does this disinformation actually change behavior or reinforce existing beliefs and behavior? And can we better understand the impact of disinformation on public knowledge and shared perceptions of reality? Uh, how can we increase dialogue and communication across social divides? And how do different countries, governments, election management bodies try to address disinformation? What can we learn from those? Uh, let's try to wrap up quickly here. Lastly, when I take when I look back at all of this, um, how does this impact our measures and our understanding of election in integrity? Do we need to refine our approaches, our concepts? Do we need to update international standards? Toby's asked us. So I would say to that, we need to look at the, the strong existing international framework for standards and human rights and ask ourselves in the context of the changing international order and new technologies, uh, to what extent do we feel like we understand sufficiently those threats and do we need to, to develop in some some different ways that you know the core most difficult challenge international observers face is this assessing the impact of social media and disinformation and hate speech on an election integrity it's very hard first to understand the scope of the problem and to understand the degree to which it's actually impacting the quality of elections um, and election integrity and you know connected to all of this is to what extent is it uh, acceptable for states, corporations, and others to infringe on the freedom of expression that we all hold so dear? That's the you know at the, the nub of this difficult issue. A couple of uh, last questions to highlight in this: um, there is a need for greater clarity on standards that relate to data privacy, data uh, security, and transparency of algorithms, uh, and a series of questions that relate to the role of the private sector and tech platforms and their impact on election information uh, and integrity. How can and do private tech platforms reinforce or weaken the threats of digital authoritarianism? How can we use them to, to weaken digital authoritarianism and surveillance capitalism? What is What new legal, legal frameworks, technological systems, and regulations are needed that can strengthen transparency, independent oversight, and protections for privacy and, and data security? Um, so, you know, con connected to all of that from an international standards perspective, work on standards on digital campaigns, public finance, and related information flows as part of the digital campaign. I guess that, and, and the very, very last thing I would mention is we still need uh, greater standards and work on transparency of final vote counts and way to verify election facts. So. I will close with that and say this is a, a very difficult and exciting time to be looking at election integrity. Thanks, everyone. David, that was absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. I can, I, and I can kind of feel the researchers in the in cyberspace kind of sucking up all these questions and thinking, ravenously writing them down and thinking that's the research agenda uh, for the next few years. So I think they'll find that uh, tremendously helpful and also uh, very inspiring. Um, so. Thank you, David. Um, next up, I thought we'd go to uh, Therese Pierce-Lolana, uh, who's the Head of Electoral 
uh, processes at International Idea. Um, Therese has a background working in elections on, in, on the field, the headquarters at policy levels as well. Uh, also uh, an experienced academic too. Uh, she's been a founder member of International Idea, but also works uh, across other organizations such as IFAS, UNDP, uh, and so on. So many, so many places to, to mention. So it's a real delight to have you here, Therese. Thank, thank you. Thanks uh, so much. Let me put my timer on. There we go. Because I have a long, I mean, David um, has put an agenda, a research agenda that's like this big, and um, I think I'll just make it worse. So, um, oh, well, um, but I will stop at 10 minutes and uh, not, not give any more. I have a list of one. So I'll be thinking uh, also, so if David gave the kind of perspective of democratic environment and, and democracy, I'll be go from another direction and think more about those who are organizing elections. And I'm thinking about those that we deal with at International IDEA, those that IFAS deal with um, and UNDP that we work with directly, um, uh, ECHES, those types of organizations, we, we deal with um, electoral management bodies and so forth, and, and we really feel their pain but also increasingly regulatory agencies, parliamentary committees and stuff, um, looking for practical solutions like, ah, what do we do? Um, and I'm thinking also on behalf of um, the users of the ACE project, um, many of us who are here are really hoping that the ACE project and the Electoral Integrity project will get closer together so that your research is, is used and applicable to, to users of the ACE project, but also of the many courses that are out there that are um, helping to, to bring the new community of, of election managers and election practitioners um, up, whether that be the Bridge Project or master's programs like, like MEPA and others, um, academies and training centers and so forth. So I, I've got them in the back of my mind. Um, and so I'll, I'll be a bit practical in terms of what they might need. And my framing, uh, the three, larger framings that I have is that uh, I think we need to invite a wider disciplinary pool. Um, I think that we need methodologies, research methodologies that focus more on process and less on structure. And as a community, um, David asked for stronger rigorous thinking and I'd like to add to that wider and deeper and I'll explain how, like kind of getting into the guts, getting into the weeds um, of what's actually going on and that we as a, as a community uh, commit to doing that. So let me start with um, inviting more disciplines. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with elections for uh, 29 years now. I started in 1992, yeah, 20, 29 years. And the, this is an area where, yes, as Toby said, it may have existed before, but I certainly didn't know about it. Um, but those who were first, to my knowledge, were political scientists, and that was excellent. They were, and political scientists, and very much um, thanks to the pioneers of the Electoral Integrity Project, um, Pippa Norris especially, but also people like Robert Pastor, Terence Lyons, people like that in the early days, who, Rafael Lopez Pintor, who took electoral management seriously. So not just the electoral systems and voter turnout, um, which were the interest of many political scientists, but who actually put the spotlight on electoral management. And to them, um, we all, all of us here today, uh, both scholars and practitioners, we owe that, those pioneers um, a debt of gratitude. And then slowly but surely, and very, very welcomed, um, was the inclusion of more public administration scholars, of which um, Professor Toby James is, is one, uh, and also legal scholars um, interested in, in this topic. And that is um, excellent because, and here's going to be my argument for the different disciplines, is they look under different stones. They'll, they'll look for different things. So if we think a political scientist might be interested in the structures, so for example, correlating, you know, uh, independence of, you know, type of election management body with uh, public surveys on trust or uh, voter turnout patterns, uh, that type of thing, the kind of structural patterns. Uh, a public administration person will know 
well, what's it like to do that kind of work? They have a, a different lens and, and a different theory base and a different skill set to bring in. And that was hugely helpful to see the field from a, a public administration point of view. And then we had, I, I don't know how many of you have had the privilege of reading Graham Orr's Rhythm and Ritual of Electoral Systems, but that looked at, at it, it lifted up different stones or, or perhaps um, use a different metaphor, it shone at a light from, from a different angle. And that was on what, um, what elections mean to us as citizens um, beyond the utilitarian, I mean, beyond who got elected, what does the actual act of going to vote mean? And those are examples of, of just when different people with dis different disciplinary backgrounds look at something, they look, they look at it in a different way. And I think that's what we should be inviting more of. And let me give a few examples of what I'd like to see. I'd like to see not only these disciplines, but also some comparisons, like what they've learned from other sectors that they could bring to ours. A few examples, environmentalists, the environmental field, uh, those that are studying uh, climate change movements and so forth. Um, how did they get the global impact that they did? How did they manage to change the discourse? Um, um, how, how did those cops work with everybody coming together? Uh, and what was behind it? And what can we learn to help us answer those big questions that David Carroll put forward? Um, I think we need to be multiple uh, types of people working together to solve some of those really, really tough problems. And an example of that is the environmental movement. They've learned how to do that. What can we learn from, from them? Another type of scholar uh, I'd like to invite into ours is development studies. Um, too much money has gone in, as we all know, to organizing events. And this development thinking has kind of set in, but not completely. And what can we learn about institutions strengthening robust institutions for the long run, trusted institutions, uh, from those that have been working in other sectors, whether it's some um, supporting the policing sector or reforms of the military and so forth. What's worked and what of that could be applicable to the electoral assistance that's put into the electoral field. Another example is um, social psychology, uh, where those scholars have been looking for years at what makes people trust public authorities. Why do people agree to pay taxes? Why do people abide by the law? Um, and those learnings are important for building trusted institutions and for understanding why people comply with the rules. And in particular, in this case, maybe political actors and so forth is, is what does compliance um, look like? And in terms of legal scholars, uh, encouraging that wider group beyond the black letter law, um, those that are involved in just say law and society or regulatory studies or criminology, and that is what types of regulatory mixes are effective to get the types of results that we need to see to combat disinformation or many of the ills that David Carroll um, was talking about. So regulation around um, money and politics or around information is incredibly high on the agenda now. Um, whether it's the UK, the Netherlands, Germany, um, or, or um, I'm trying to think Fiji, uh, it, it's, it's coming up everywhere is, is how do we regulate and what does a, a good regulatory mix look like? Is law enough? And that's where those law and society scholars and, and criminologists and so forth can, can be helpful. Um, what do you regulate um, and, and how and what other incentive systems or levers are there that we can use? What does regulatory design look like and so forth and what works in other sectors? So that brings me to this topic of, of methodology. And I mentioned that, oh, and let me add one more discipline, which may seem a little bit off uh, out, but I think we need more engineers uh, because the integrity of the electoral process from a an electoral management point of view is really about um, chains of custody. It is a lot of materials that are going out and then need to be brought back together again. And I think within the engineering field um, are those skill sets who know how to have rigorous quality control um, of every single chain of, of movement of whether it's, it's goods or information um, out and back again. 
And that needs to be made available in a kind of a, a way that we can all understand um, because we, we need that in the electoral administration field, especially in our courses, we need to be able to teach that. So more engineers, please. I would also say more anthropologists and more ethnographers. We need to be able to identify, just say we are an observer, how do we measure um, a culture of fear? How do we measure this sense that something's wrong, that kind of unease? And these are skill sets that ethnographers um, and, and anthropologists have of being able to, to codify, um, whether it's, it's body language or, or discourse analysis or, so we need better words for fear. And that was my 10 minutes. All right. Um, and so I'll, I'll, so more disciplines to shine the light on these different um, difficult questions in, in more ways. And methodology, um, as I said, I'd like to see much more um, process-oriented methodologies, more case studies, more causal process training, um, causal process tracing, and so forth. And that's to understand what the rollout of something looks like, not just this is good and this is bad, or more of this is good and more of that is bad, but what is it actually like to roll out reform? And how do you do that in a way, what happens to unintended consequences? How do you bring people along with you? And if you can follow that through a, a case study or, or retroactively backwards or um, using these various techniques um, that exist in, in, in social anthropology and so forth, I, I think we can really, really learn um, a lot. In terms of our community um, itself, I'm just thinking this electoral integrity project community, let's grow it. Um, this is extraordinary that we're all in a room together. Let's keep this up, these kind of regular ways of, of pushing, of, of taking an agenda and, and pushing it forward. And a few things that I'm hoping um, Chad will have time since my time is up to bring up as well is not only would we like um, the scholars to have access to materials, but we'd like to encourage electoral management bodies to include research units and research habits uh, in their own work and to advocate for that. And that means we kind of have to work together to have something that's predictable, um, you know, a predictable yearly survey, for example, or every second year survey that everybody knows is the survey so we don't um, bombard them and so forth. And I think together we're working um, slowly closer to that. I know the ACE project community is very interested in seeing that happen. And the Electoral Integrity Project is very close with this new funding. So let's, um, let's really grow. And I will leave it at that. Uh, it's just such a pleasure. I wish everybody um, a really productive conference. Thanks for being so brave and doing it with this new, new me. So thanks to all who are involved. Have a great week. Thank you, Therese. That was magnificent as ever. I really, really, I'm sure everyone also really, really appreciates um, those, those points. And really key thing about interdisciplinary thinking there and how actually we need to go and kind of tap up our colleagues in other departments uh, across our university campuses that perhaps we've never spoken to. And we need to tell them you need to get into elections, come and join you on this research project and get, do get them involved um, on the intellectual integrity project there as well. Okay, so next up uh, we have um, Chad Vickery, um, who's the Vice President of Global Strategy and Technical Leadership at the International Foundation for Electoral Systems, IFAS, I think, as I think everyone calls it, uh, and obviously has extensive knowledge and international election administration experience. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand the floor over to you, Chad. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, Toby. Um, I also want to thank Toby and Holly um, as uh, IFA sees our relationship with the Election Integrity Project is a very important relationship that has helped advance our own research and publications in a positive directions and it's influenced the projects we conduct around the world. So I hope you know that your work is having an impact. Um, and I also have to thank PIPA for creating the EIP and including practitioners in the discussion uh, for almost a decade now. Part of the impetus for Erica Schein and myself um, developing the Center for Applied Research and Learning at IFAS was based on the work that we've done with the EIP, the academic and practitioner relationships we've made uh, during this EIP meeting. So I, I hope many times I think people think that these events um, are not that important or that we have too many of them, but I wanna say that this one is unique and it's really contributed. So um, thank you all for that. Um, I also want to say that it's completely unfair that I had to follow David and Teresa because she basic, they basically um, stole a lot of my thunder. I'll try to bring some, 
some other uh, viewpoints to that, but I'll probably be a little bit quick. Um, I do think that um, there, as, as Teresa and, and David has mentioned, there are the two main issues that we're, that we're really focusing on right now and we all need to focus on. And that's working in closing spaces and building trust in, in uh, democratic governance. Um, first, I think, you know, we, we see in the international community uh, one policy to confront bad actors, and that is to name shame and isolate those bad actors, um, which I think we need to ask the question, does that work? Um, I would suggest that it doesn't, but I don't have the evidence. So it'd be great if folks were able to really research this. Um, I think what's really changed, as David has suggested, is bad actors now have options. The Belt and Road Initiative by China, Russia, others. I think when the international community, the West, uh, the democratic international community um, tries to isolate bad actors, they do not see the cost in it as they did before. Um, and we need to have an answer for that. And I also think for practitioners, something that we desperately need is uh, the answer to the question, how do we actually intervene and work in these closing spaces? Um, as you all know, the uh, first thing governments do is they change the law for NGOs and how they can um, register in a country. Um, they start to uh, really go in a nationalist direction and make any international involvement seem as a very negative. Um, so it's very difficult for organizations like IDEA, Carter Center, IFAS, others to operate in these countries. And we also want to work with a do no harm policy, we don't want to bring danger to the, our civil society partners we're working with. And so how do we intervene in these environments? And I, I do think we need to look at this question because what everybody's answer is, is working from outside the country and doing some media work, maybe doing some IT work, maybe financing civil society groups. Um, we need more tools in our toolbox than that. Um, and it would be great uh, for uh, academics to work with us in that and, I'll, I'll, and also others, which I think Therese uh, hit on and I will as well. Uh, second, you know, it's this, how do we focus on, and this is the topic of this conference, how do we build trust in democratic governance? There's just a lack of trust. And it's not just in the places that we work around the world, it's in our own countries. Um, and so we've looked at some very specific things. You know, we've looked at how and when you could use risk limiting audits. Um, we've looked at how you properly investigate complaints and show transparent um, results and to verify results. But we need to know other areas. Um, and one thing that David hit on was, most importantly, do democracies deliver services for their citizens? Are they actually providing benefits for citizens so they know that the country's working properly? And when I see proposals, when I see the work that, that um, practitioners do, for some reason, we're focused on institutions or maybe the NGOs we're working with. Sometimes this connective tissue of what the average everyday citizen is experiencing is lost. And I'm wondering if that's part of the reason why they see this whole as an elite exercise um, rather than something that's benefiting them. And I think some of the nationalist trends that we're seeing around the world are feeding into that. And it'd be interesting to learn more about that. And then, um, as was mentioned earlier, we really do need to have more interdisciplinary events. Um, and I, from my experience being a, a recovering lawyer, um, the legal community really doesn't know what the political scientists are doing and not very many political scientists know what the legal community is doing. Um, and sometimes I think we either are recreating the will or working at cross purposes. I was at a legal um, conference not too long ago where there was a whole panel on the need to develop international standards for elections. The entire group not realizing all the work that's been done um, for decades in this area. And I was twisting in my chair um, trying to get people to listen to me, but it, it sometimes that doesn't come across. Um, but, you know, sometimes I hear political scientists that don't understand what legal scholars have done either. Um, and then another thing that we see in our community in particular, which I find really remarkable, with, I have some background in economics, is that we talk about doing political economy analysis. This is a, a very trendy thing um, that donors are asking for. But I have not been involved in any political economy analysis where there's an actual economist on part of the team, nor do we talk about economic theory. Um, <laughs> And you know what are the what are the incentives that that drive people to make the choices they do? I think this was discussed earlier, but economics has been looking at this for years. 
but we really just do a lot of political anon analysis and call it a, a PEA. Um, also, I think there's been so much work done in the anti-corruption community um, that I think needs to be more intertwined with elections and democracy. Um, just recently, we're working uh, with a group that had no idea that anti-corruption organizations have looked at state capture and the elements of state capture and how you would address it. it um, the suggestion was to have a, a research project to look at this like it hasn't been done before. And it's just a it's just a illustration of how we need to have more of these bodies talking to each other. And if the EIP could help facilitate that and would be uh, very, very helpful. Um, also, I think in my experience, I've taken it at heart um, what the EIP has suggested to get academics and practitioners to work together. Um, I've really tried to do this as much as I can, but there really is, a, our incentives are not aligned. What academics need to, to look at the topic they're looking at and to publish on that very specific issue they're looking at doesn't really align with what a practitioner needs. Um, to further their project and either to write a proposal or to design activities and to measure that. And, and it's, we've tried very hard, but it's very hard to get those incentives to align so that we're all working towards um, something. We all believe in the larger mission that we're all, you know, in supporting democracy and elections. But for some reason that down in the weeds alignment of incentives isn't there. So we're not able to really work together the way that I think that we could. Um, you know, we have different timelines and we have, you know, we have different experiences that just don't seem to work, although we've had some projects. And then, you know, why, how do we get, as, uh, as was mentioned earlier, how do we get EMBs to see, or uh, election management bodies or other um, institutions to see the incentives that would benefit them working with scholars and uh, folks like IFAS. Uh, if we did do these uh, yearly surveys, how can we provide more management information to the EMB so that they get some benefit out of this and it's not just them providing um, data to the scholars? I think if we were able to answer some of these questions, we would get a more productive results. Um, and then uh, I'll be very quick in the last bit. Um, one thing that was discussed by David was, you know, the, the technology environment in which we're working in. And I think, you know, disinformation and cybersecurity and other things are obviously something we're dealing with uh, on a daily basis. But I can't say enough, and it was mentioned earlier, where are we going with the surveillance um, government? Uh, and how is artificial intelligence and big data going to influence this? Um, you know, is ransomware being used to retaliate? Uh, what are we going to do in that environment? I think we really have to push those issues forward. Um, and that, again, gets to the point where uh, we need to have people who are looking at these issues as part of these discussions. Um, we've recently hired a cybersecurity uh, specialist who's fantastic, but he has a completely different group of colleagues at another language. Um, the way that they work is completely unique to that group. How do we bring them into what we're doing so we understand each other and build the tools we need? Um, so I think, you know, how do we, do we need to update international standards? I think it's, it's going to have to be in this holistic view of things um, and look at how, in the end of the day, is the citizen receiving benefits from democratic governance so that they will support uh, what they have to do, the sacrifice to participate, to be part of the process? Do they see a benefit in it? I think we really have to start looking at it from an individual's uh, point of view and not always from uh, an institution's point of view. So those would be my uh, additions to this. Um, as I said, much of this was discussed earlier, so I didn't go over everything, but I look very forward to um, uh, hearing the rest of the conversation and answering any questions you may have. Thank you. Jazz, thank you so much once again. It's brilliant. Again, gives people very many uh, kind of research ideas there. And it's a very important point I think you made about the alignment of, it, of incentives. Um, working at a university in the UK, we have something called the Research Excellence Framework, which isn't always the friend of academics, but one of the things that that is involved is assessing universities by how much impact they have, which means you do often find lots of academics trying to, to reach those measurable goals that you're, you're kind of talking about. It really does suggest that part of the battle is therefore to reach out to deans and higher education managers and universities to make this part of their, their strategic goals there as well. So thank you, Chad. Uh, fantastic uh, as ever. 
Uh, and then we now now have um, Rucania um, Castanelli, who is a democracy scholar uh, and an associate professor at the University of Mauritius. Uh, but she's also the chair of the Institute, sorry, the Lecturer Institute for Sustainable Democracy in Africa, uh, a board member of the West Africa um, Democracy Radio and CEO of the African Media in Initiative. Um, I could go on, but Again, I think uh, we are so lucky to have you uh, with us here um, this afternoon or this morning. Uh, okay, so over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Toby. And sorry for missing the time. I think time zones, Zoom meetings sometimes, you know, we live in various parts of the world and time zones don't always align, <laughs> talking about alignment. So thank you. I'm going to, I'm sorry I was not here before. Maybe there might be a slight repetition, but I'm going to actually take three of the issues or the three questions that uh, Toby and uh, Holly Ann sent us. So what does a practitioner com community need more? Uh, I think it's an evidence-based solution. I'm an academic, but also, you know, I interact a lot with practitioners in terms of election management, in terms of democracy uh, and the quality of elections. And I think it's a lot of evidence-based solution. Coming from the continent, Africa, which is 54 countries with 54 specificities and differences and, and different experience with elections and democracy, I think uh, getting from the field what are the differences, what are the, the similarities would help us sort of understand a little bit better the ecosystem. And I think that is very interesting when we're looking at, at how elections are run, uh, integrity around elections, uh, quality of elections. And the question that comes often to us is, are these um, experiences and experiments uh, around, uh, you know, the various evidence, are they replicable? Do, are they you know, specific to that particular country, or they can be sort of rolled out in the region and maybe across the continent, because in certain parts of the of the continent, we have differences in terms of Francophone Africa, Anglophone Africa, and even Arabophone Africa. So, you know, the experiences might be different. So are they scalable? So I think that's the first element uh, has a practitioner one would like to see and also probably again reconcile what is coming out in the literature. So that's the first element that I, I think is interesting. The second element, you know, that we've encountered is to the need to zoom a little bit more on the uh, ecosystem that exists. Elections happen, but they don't happen in a vacuum. They don't happen, you know, uh, outside socio-political cultural, um, very often on the continent, ethnic, tribal issues. So I think the ecosystem is very important to understand and to link it up in terms of the elections that are being rolled out, the types of systems that are being rolled out. Because we've seen, you know, as we understand elections and how elections are managed and run, and the perceptions that elections have in different countries that we run elections is that there's an underlying and undercurrent linked to poverty, linked to inequality, and even linked to corruption. And those three, those three pronged approach, you know, to a great extent affect people's understanding of how an election is delivered and how does it change uh, their lifestyles or their livelihoods. So I think understanding that sort of underlying ecosystem will allow us to be able to connect better with the outcomes of election and that elections are actually delivering on on the on on the promises that they are supposed to to do and that has a direct uh, relevance and impact for when we talk about integrity of election so i think that's an element that we have been very conscious uh, at um, both at ISA, but also those of us who are working in the democratic democracy election space the last example that I would like to sort of bring here is, you know, I'm the chair of ISA and ISA has offered an interesting sort of case study because um, this year we're actually celebrating 25 years of existence. Um, it's an interesting moment to actually sort of take stock of what has been done in that space. And, I'll, you know, and what has actually been done in that space is that there has been a lot of what we call bridging the divide between different stakeholders. Very often we see 
that you know um, in the field of elections you have the scholars on one side you have the civil society on the other side you have the EMBs on another side and you have the international observers on another side so there's this need to really bring all those various stakeholders together and to understand that there is this need for a common space and a common understanding so that you know um, the understanding of elections and the delivery of elections is done in a better way. So there's been three examples that I would like to sort of surface out here. The first example, and here it's also talking about, and it probably touches on international standards and benchmarks. Um, in 2003, and maybe some of our friends on this call will be aware of that, uh, ISA helped sort of um, establish the PMO. Uh, the principles of election management, monitoring and observation principles. Um, it was basically used and developed as a benchmark to be able to sort of harmonize uh, and uh, you know, the, the practice and observation of elections. And that elections have a, a process of a pre-phase, the election and the post-phase. And that was very important to try and understand how you know, that the whole process would be assessed and evaluated. It's been 2003, it's been nearly uh, 17 years, uh, past 17 years. And it's it's been an interesting way of actually sort of ensuring that the observation is done uh, across that way. So PIMO, what's interesting about PIMO, the principles of election management, monitoring and observation, it's, it's been an African-based uh, homegrown sort of set of guidelines, which I think is very important because we don't want, to, I think, to see this cut and paste approach because very often specificities are in a particular region, in a particular continent, doesn't, don't always allow us to sort of have this cut and paste approach. So I think developing much more homegrown home specificity, continent-based sort of guidelines are very helpful. The other element that I would like to sort of also bring to the, to, to, in terms of practitioners community, is that we help develop what we call, and I mentioned that a couple, last time then when we met, the ISA popular system. It's interesting because it's in fact also a homegrown technology that has been developed by ISA. It's an open source uh, data collection, collation, and analysis of data in real time. And it has really helped in terms of uh, data uh, uh, aggregation and data sort of tabulation. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. So I think this has also been an interest in the practitioners community to develop tools, a toolkit that can help in terms of facilitating the whole, the whole process. And I think it's interesting to also document that, you know, there are some interesting toolkits that are coming from you know, uh, certain parts of the world uh, in, in, which are user-friendly and which are very often indigenous driven. Um, so that's, so at the end of the day, when we talk about the practitioner's community uh, needs, it has to be practical, it has to be evidence-based, it has to be solution-driven. And I think to a certain extent, it has to be innovation-driven in terms of being able to sort of have this great mix because, uh, you know, what happens in the real world is obviously very interesting to be able to document on procedures and practices and principles. The second element, uh, the second question that I wanted to sort of zoom on, uh, what are the threats? I think you pose that question. And for me, you know, uh, it cuts both ways because threats can be challenges and they can also be opportunities. But has we actually look at um, uh, election management, integrity, and, and, and the running of elections in, in the last couple of years, we've seen ICT come in a very strong way, uh, information, communication, and technology. And, you know, for me, it has been democratic great gains, but it has also created a number of democratic deficits. Um, so we have to be very careful how the data is being used, personal data, how do EMBs relate to technology? Because again, uh, in a number of elections that have been recently held, there's been a lot of issues around, you know, data sort of sovereignty and data sort of manipulation and, and, and the manner in which EMBs have actually sort of related and responded to ICT. 
So some gains that are, we've seen recently in, in, in some of the elections around results management, and especially around aggregation and tabulation of, of data and of, of, of uh, um, election results and data results. And here we've seen a number of gains, uh, and, and that has happened around the PVT, the, the, the parallel voting tabulation. I think uh, in a number of elections, we've seen the elections in Sierra Leone, in 2018, in Kenya in 2017, in DRC in 2018, and Malawi in 2019, where you know the PVTs have been used to actually sort of you know uphold the, the whole issue of uh, electoral integrity. So I think you know using technology and certain types of technology that help to sort of create an ecosystem of trust and ecosystem of integrity can help. So technology is an interesting element, but we need to know how to use it. Uh, and, and, and what type of technology serves better the interests. Again, I, I caution against the cut and paste approach of a, 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 a sort of a, a very bulk and a very sort of, um, you know, wholesale approach to technology. So we need to be very careful about certain technologies that are more meaningful or more relevant. And we've seen also in certain cases in parts of Africa is that technology can also, you know, create a lot of problems because you have internet shutdowns around elections, so technology doesn't work there. You have, you know, a slow internet connection, so in, um, technology will not work. So we have to really sort of balance it out. The other element that I've seen has a threat, but also can can act as a bit of a problematic. And I think there's interesting research to be done in that, and interesting sort of, um, you know, uh, understanding that 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 sort of push and pull is the role of the judiciary. Increasingly on the continent, we've seen uh, the judiciary playing a very very important role, and 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 it it it, it it's interesting, but it also is problematic because it tells you, you know, why is the judiciary becoming more and more an important player uh, and stakeholder in the delivery of election results. And I think here in the last um, uh, 10 years or so, since uh, 2012, we've seen six very important court, uh, um, electoral court petitions in, in on the continent, the case of uh, Ghana, Zambia, Kenya, Nigeria and recently Malawi. So how, 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 what are the push and pulls around the judiciary? How much can you allow the judiciary to sort of uh, ensure that election results are delivered and are, 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 are given? So we have to be very careful about, you know, this push and pull uh, approach. And very often, what implications do they have for the credibility and independence of EMBs? Some people uh, argue the case that EMBs get stronger when you have electoral petitions, but some EMBs get very often overwhelmed by those petitions. And, and so we have to be careful about, you know, this push and pull element. Last but not least, uh, I wanted to sort of uh, shine some light on the gaps in knowledge. I think there are a number of gaps. Um, you know, in terms of how do we sort of uh, enhance the quality of that space around integrity. I think the very important element, and we're starting to look at that, is the role of electoral observation mission. And here I'm speaking more specifically about um, continental African-based electoral observation mission. Very often, you know, uh, because of political sensitivity, sensitivities and because you know certain um, continental uh, electoral observation missions are um, you know invited uh, by the host government so very so sometimes they are very timid in terms of their their statements and in their and in terms of the delivery of their, their their statement around the quality of elections very often you have this rubber stamped approach of free and fair uh, elections um, and and that creates a little bit of tension in terms of the validity, the credibility, the integrity, and even the value of such electoral observation missions. So there's a need to understand a lot more about, you know, their function, their value, the impact, because, uh, you know, very often people, you know, sometimes in the space say, well, is election observation mission 
a bit about electoral sort of tourism. Uh, so we have to be very careful. And I think there's an interesting space, a gap of knowledge to be able to start to document around how we can strengthen the, the value and the impact and the meaningfulness of those um, of those electoral uh, observation mission. I'm speaking more specifically about those that are coming out of the continent. The other element that I think is that there's a gap is that very often people believe that elections are, you know, are a bit of what we call a democratic formality. So we need to go beyond that democratic formality and, you know, and demonstrate how elections and whether it's the quality of elections, whether it's the integrity of elections can help the, and change the lives of people. Because otherwise you get this sort of democratic sort of depression, you get this democratic sort of fatigue and people just sort of say, well, just in other elections, I'm not interested. So I think there's a need to sort of document a little bit more on terms in terms of moving from that democratic formality and making people understand and value why elections matter to their livelihoods. Um, the last but not least, I think, is, um, is to understand a little bit more around the cost of elections, because the cost of elections, you know, have a great impact on the integrity of elections. And I know that there, are such, uh, there is the Westminster Foundation for Democracy. I did the research for Mauritius. And there is an interesting sort of interplay between how much an election costs and how integrity and, and how is the value of, of integrity around an election. So I think an, a, a sort of a, an interesting sort of uh, uh, cost, uh, uh, cost analysis and cost evaluation can help us sort of bridge the gap and move away from these 10 alone approaches. So these are some of the preliminary thoughts that I had. I wanted to zoom on the three, uh, what I thought uh, are, are the more relevant issues, but there's much more, but I'll allow you know the conversation to go on and then I can chip in at a later point. Thank you. <laughs>